somewhere in England's green and pleasant land, not far from Oxford, where Alice lived in Lewis Carroll's learned milieu, this girl has fallen asleep by slow flowing waters. Like the river, you imagine everything has drifted. The book has slid from a reading plane and Alice slips into slumber. But then what's the story in the background with the little campsite? Who are these indigenous folk who live in a bark humpy rather than a palatial apartment in Gothic style? Is their bush reality just a projection of Alice's dream before she went on to Wonderland? Maybe the noble savage would receive her and teach her and an alternative life to that of her Victorian elite. Actually, the campsite motif wasn't Polly's idea to begin with. Indigenous people are already there in the source, grafted from a picture of Evelyn Hatch. So Charles Dodgson, that's Lewis Carroll, had a 25 year association with Bessie and Edwin Hatch, vice principal at St Mary's Hall at Oxford. The Hatch family had three daughters, Beatrice, Ethel and Evelyn, who seemed happy to pose for Dodgson in the nude. I think that the surrounding landscape was um, painted in watercolour by Anne Lydia Bond in um, 1879, the same way that Beatrice was treated six years earlier. Showing me the hand-coloured photographs of Charles Dodgson, Polixeni asked me if I could paint around the figure in her own photograph an insinuator landscape that situates the studio model in deep space. It, it, it would have been beyond me because there are terrible problems with edge control as you blot out everything in the room but leave the figure as an unadulterated photograph. It would be hard to make the field coherent and to give the space atmospheric integrity. So we came up with this idea of instead painting the landscape as a scenic backdrop upon which Olympia would act. The idea appealed to Polly um, because she loved the idea of acting on a stage. And so began the development of these dioramas under Polixeni's supervision, which in time grew to about three metres square. Um, though the first ones were tiny and difficult for Olympia to act upon. The backdrop is painted so that part of it works as a vertical curtain behind Olympia. Part of it works as a, a horizontal stage that she walks upon and a transitional part between them near the skirting board that reconciles the contrary planes. But Lexani was fascinated with what the backdrop could achieve and sometimes she took the same photograph with a black backdrop and a painted one to weigh up the, the difference. An example is Olympia as Lewis Carroll, uh, his exe kitchen as Chinaman on tea boxes on duty, which uh, from memory she photographed after producing the off duty counterpart with the scenic backdrop. Sometimes she wanted deep perspectival space and at other times she wanted an absolute photographic concentration on the figure and props calling upon you to interpolate a scene, a, a bit like putting your own Anne Boyd, Anne Bond watercolour in, in, your, in your imagination. The painted backdrop locating the figure in an idyllic landscape stipulates what's there. The luxury of painting is that it lets you put anything there that you like, but the flip side is that nothing is ever there by accident. It has to have a purpose. And so 30 metres away, some indigenous folk are camping in a field. In Polixeni's photograph, they don't look so much like American First Peoples as in the Evil and Hatch work, but Australian Indigenous. It seemed somehow wrong in an interpretation from the Southern Hemisphere, not to acknowledge the story of colonisation in Victoria that confoundingly blended genocidal practices with the archetype of noble savage. It's a reality far from Oxford um, with its ancient Greek and mathematics, but it hangs over all the innocent people and their studies and from time to time creeps into their unconscious. The people who have been shoved away return. They meant us no harm and we devastated their culture 
their languages, their heritage, and often murdered them. But for now, they're happily in a field, perhaps in Alice's head when she dreams of an existence so remote from grammar and logic. Polixeni was herself dreaming in a way that foreshadowed Wonderland, where she could imagine that Alice might be, or you know, like what she might be thinking. She always used to say that her next body of work inhered in the previous body of work. There would always be one picture that would suggest the following series. This picture was the watershed for Wonderland, for which Polixena used the same backdrop in a work that already had the characteristic Alice dress. If the indigenous people peacefully inhabit the dream at ease in their traditional space, the dream is no longer about a claim. Today, it's common to exhort people to have a dream, to follow their dream, to dream large, as one of our local universities once used as a strapline. And psychoanalytically, it's sort of the opposite of a dream. The dream is not an ambition or a plan or project. For Polixeni, dreaming isn't about what you can become or how your community can advance. The dream isn't aspirational, but otherworldly, giving on to another reality, an unconscious symbolic vision that you can never devise or actualize, but that tells you stories about yourself. Polixeni returns to this inexhaustible theme in The Dream Keepers and maybe all her subsequent series. She saw pictures as a kind of dreaming, the extension of what we can imagine, where we recognize our inner investments through symbols. And it's really this sense of extensions into other perspectives, physical, artificial, and symbolic, and all aesthetically reconciled, that makes Polixeni's work so sublime.